right, so now let's look at um, some more of the properties of total variation. So what we have here in theorem 6.11 is really just a statement that um, functions that total variation is additive across um, subintervals. And so if we've got a function f that's of bounded variation on an, on an interval a to b, and if we pick some value c that's on the interior of that interval, then if we restrict from the interval a to b to the interval a to c, then that function is of bounded variation on that subinterval. But it's also of bounded variation on the subinterval from c up to the right endpoint at b. And even more than that, um, not only are they just a function of bounded variation on those subintervals, but the total variation across the entire interval a to b is equal to the total variation um, across the subinterval from a to c, and plus the sub in the total variation across the subinterval from c on up to b. And so let's take a look at the proof to see why that's going to be true. Um, we start off with um, two partitions, so let's start off with partitioning the interval from um, A up to C, and we'll choose that partition to be P. We'll choose another partition Q of the interval from C on up to B. Now, what we're able to do is extend P and Q to partitions of the entire interval from A to B, really by just um, taking the um, partition from A to C and adding on a right endpoint so that we um, get up to B and we can take our in our partition Q of C to B and add on a left endpoint and that's going to give us um, a partition from A over to B. Now for the um, variation of the function on with respect to this interval P, so we've got this summation well, if we take that usual summation and we add on one more term from f of b minus f of c, so the absolute value of that term, then that actually is the total variation that we, or the variation that we have um, with respect to p prime for f. Now, we can continue that and kind of by the same token what that means is that um, our variation on f with respect to p, so for our um, subinterval, is going to be less than or equal to the variation with respect to p prime, and that's going to be less than or equal to the variation of f over a b. And so what that tells us is because p was just an arbitrary partition, that um, the total variation over the entire subinterval is going to be an upper bound, and so f is of bound bounded variation on A to C. Now that same kind of argument is really just going to hold for Q. Um, we take the variation of F over Q, we add on one more term, that's going to be, um, so this, so it's going to be um, our variation with respect to Q prime, which is going to be bounded by our total variation of F on the entire subinterval AB. So the same kind of argument is going to hold to show that F is going to be of bounded variation on the subinterval from C to B. Okay, so now what we can do is to say, um, well, let's pick a partition P um, now for the entire um, interval A to B. And so one of two things can happen. Either C is going to be an element of P or C is not going to be an element of P. So let's take the initial condition that C is going to be an element of P. Well, what that means that our partition P looks like, we've got our left endpoint, and at some point in here we've got um, C being equal to X sub M for some M. So C is in our M position there, and so if we look at all of the 
all of the um, x values from c on over to a, well that's going to be a partition p prime of a to c. And from c on over to b, well that's going to be a partition p double prime from c over to b. And so what this really means is that the variation of f with respect to p is actually going to be the sum of the variations of f with respect to p prime plus the variation of f with respect to p double prime. Now both of the t these two terms are going to be less than or equal to the total variation of f on a to c and the total variation of f from c to b. And so what we're, um, the conclusion we're left with then is that the total variation across the entire interval from A to B is going to be <clears throat> less than or equal to the sum of the variations across the two subintervals. Okay. Well, now let's look at the case if C happens to not be an element of the partition that we chose. Well, that means that we have... C in between um, x sub m minus 1 and x sub m for some m. Now, if we look at the total variation, or the variation of f with respect to p, then we've got the summation from 1 up to n. Well, we're going to take the first m minus 1 terms. We're going to separate those out. Um, from our mth term, so x sub m minus f of x sub m minus 1, and then we're going to group the remainder of the terms from m plus 1 up to n into this sum. And so the trick that we then play is to um, subtract f sub c and add on f of c um, in the term that we separated out. Now, of course, what happens next is we apply the triangle inequality to separate those out. So our variation of f with respect to p is going to be less than or equal to um, the first sum from 1 up to m minus 1, um, the sum from m plus 1 up to n, and then the two terms that we separated by the triangle inequality. Well, if we group um, one term, so if we group f of c minus f of x sub m minus 1, um, absolute value. So if we group those with our first sum, and we group our second term with the second sum, then what happens, we see that um, this is going to be less than or equal to the variation of f with respect to p prime plus the variation of f with respect to p double prime where we have actually kind of formed new partitions p prime from a to c and p double prime from a to c. And so um, even in this case we still get that the total variation from A to B is going to be less than or equal to the sum of the total variations across the two subintervals. Okay. Um, for the opposite side, now we're going to say, well, let's see what happens if we take any epsilon greater than zero and so what that means by the definition of the supremum that we've got partitions p prime of um, a from a to c and p double prime from c to b such that the total variation of f between a and c minus epsilon over 2 is going to be less than um, the variation of f um, with respect to p prime and the total variation from C to B minus epsilon over 2 is going to be less than the variation of F with respect to P double prime. Now that's just really going to be true if we take our least upper bound and we subtract a little bit. Well, there has to be some value um, in the set that w over which we're taking the supremum that makes... Um, makes the value where we subtracted the little bit not an upper bound anymore. And so that's really what we're using um, in both of these instances. And so where we go from there is to say that, well, if we take 
the partition P to be the union of the partition P prime and the par uh, partition P double prime, then um, we, if we add both of sides of those inequalities together, then we get our total variation from A to C minus epsilon over 2, plus the total variation of F from C to B minus epsilon over 2. Well, that's going to be less than our variations with respect to P prime and P double prime. But those two are equal to um, the variation of F with respect to the partition P, and that has to be bounded above by the total variation of F on A to B. And so um, what we take away from that, if we move our epsilon over 2's over to the other side, is that the total variation of F from A to C plus the total variation of F from C to B is going to be less than um, the total variation of F from A to B plus whatever arbitrary, arbitrarily small positive um, real number that we want to add on. And so what that really means is that the sum of our total variations across the subintervals is going to be less than or equal to the total variation of F from A to B. And since we've got um, inequality both directions now, what that means is that the total variation of F across the entire subinterval A to B is equal to the total variation across the sum of the total variations across the subintervals. Vamos. All right, so what that lets us do um, is to really define um, some new functions. And so one function that we will define from f um, is here in theorem 6.12. So if we've got a function f that's of bounded variation on an interval from a to b, then we want to define a new function v from the closed interval a, b to the real numbers, where v of x is going to be the total variation of f with, on the interval from a up to x. And we'll make that true for everything from um, every x strictly greater than a over all the way over to b and zero if x is equal to a. Now conclusion that we actually have for those particular function, this particular function is that v is an increasing function on the entire interval from a to b. And likewise, um, if we take v minus f, that function is also an increasing function on a to b. So let's take a look at the proof to see if we can see why that might actually be true. And so what we have, we're going to pick two values, x and y, in our interval from a to b with x less than y. So if x happens to be a, then v of x is going to be 0. And so from the definition of what we mean by total variation, v of y is going to be greater than or equal to 0. And so we see that v of y is going to be greater than or equal to v of x. So that one's kind of trivial, but anyway, um, we see it anyway. So let's see what happens now if x happens to be bigger than a. Well, this is almost a consequence of, um, it is a consequence of our theorem 6.11. So it's, um, this theorem is kind of a corollary, I guess, you, if you wanted to think about it, to that theorem. Then if we look at the total variation of V of Y from A up to Y, then because X is in between A and Y, then that separates our total variation. Well, the variation from A up to X is V of X, since um, V of F of X, Y is greater than or equal to zero, then we again kind of trivially that V of X is going to be less than or equal to V of Y. And so what that tells us is that yes, V is going to be an increasing function. Okay, so what about the interval, what about the function for the second part? If we take V of X minus F of X. Well, Let's pick our two values, so x and y um, in our interval from a to b. x is going to be less than y. Uh, 
then if we calculate v of x minus f of x, that's going to be less than or equal to v of y minus f of y exactly when f of y minus f of x is going to be less than or equal to v of y minus v of x. Well, v of y minus v of x is the total variation of f from x up to y. And so where this leads us, um, if we just look at the incredibly trivial partition from x to y of x and y, then what that tells us is that f of y minus f of x is going to be less than or equal to the absolute value of f of y minus f of x, but that's going to be less than or equal to the total variation of f from x to y. And so what that shows um, from the rearranging the identity that we had above is that v of x minus f of x is going to be less than or equal to v of y minus f of y and so v minus f is also an increasing function. And so what this actually leads us to is kind of the culmination of characterizing what it means for a function to be of bounded variation. And for that, it's pretty much a corollary almost of several of the um, theorems that we've proven already. And so we have theorem 6.13, which says that if we just have any old function f from a compact closed interval a, b um, into the real numbers, then f is going to be of bounded variation on a, b if and only if we can express f as the difference of two increasing functions. And to see where that is, let's take a look at the proof. Um, so if we let, first of all, f be a function of bounded variation, then as a consequence of theorem 6.12, we can write, um, we can take v of x to be the function from theorem 6.12 and d of x to be v of x minus f of x, again from theorem 6.12 and trivially we have if we take v of x minus d of x we get f of x and so that proves um, one direction for our theorem. For the second direction of our theorem, let's suppose that we can write f as the difference of two functions g and h, where g and h are both increasing. Well, by theorem 6.5, um, g and h are both monotonic and hence functions of bounded variation. Um, by theorem 6.9, since g and h are functions of bounded variation, the difference of those two functions is also bounded variation, hence f is a function of bounded variation. And so um, it's basically just a consequence of um, all of the theorems, uh, some of the theorem that we've proven up to this point. And so that gives us kind of a characterization of what it really means for a function to be of bounded variation. In the next video, we'll explore that just a little bit further as to what we're really talking about with the bounded variation concept.